that's coming our way. You may be seated. I want to jump right into it. And I'm going to ask you to pay attention to, if you take notes, take notes. If you uh, have your Bible, try to follow along. We have quite some scriptures that will not be on the screen, but hopefully you'll be able to keep up with it. Um, Over the last few weeks, we have been studying the parables of the kingdom, right? Uh, We took a pause last week for Father's Day, and uh, we've looked at Jesus introducing this concept of... um, The parables of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells a story. And we we, we saw Jesus teaching these concepts in this particular chapter of Matthew after uh, somewhat of having an altercation with Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law, religious people. And uh, disciples ask, "Uh, why do you why do you speak in parables? And and he says, well, I speak to them in parables, but to you, I'm going to explain the secrets of the kingdom, and as as we have been diving, of course, I'm not going to repeat everything that we've been preaching or teaching. Pastor Larry and I have been uh, taking turns in in, in sharing some of these uh, parables, and and we have learned that the kingdom is advancing, that the kingdom is growing, right? That the kingdom has been introduced in the life of Jesus Christ, and and it, it it is it is working. The way I like to say it is the way we sing it sometimes: that God is working even when we don't see it, right? He's, he's moving and if we don't see it, he, he's, he's doing something even if we're not fully aware. God is on the move and this kingdom is going to be finalized at some point when Jesus returns as a judge. There is a, there is a future hope involved in this kingdom of God. And so we have seen uh, in the same parables that the kingdom of God demands a response. We looked at the parable of the pearl and the treasure and Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like, you know, and he mentions, you know, if someone finds a treasure, he goes back or, or a land where a treasure is found. He goes and sells everything for the sake of that treasure, for the sake of that pearl. Now, over the last few weeks, interestingly enough, I have ran into some other approach approaches to interpreting parables and the kingdom of God. And if you are anything like anybody is, YouTube is uh, filled with different theologians and explanations of scripture and preachers and you ought to be careful and so just so you know you are in my heart and in my thoughts every week because I know that just like I am bombarded with content that sometimes appears to be truthful it may not be or it may bring confusion and when it comes to the kingdom for example I heard someone say well the kingdom of the uh, the parable of the kingdom of the uh, the parable of the kingdom that relates to the treasure and the pearl is is not really about us responding to the kingdom and giving it all up for that kingdom is really the the one searching for that treasure is Jesus and the treasure is you and you are that pearl and and you know in a sense well that might be true Jesus gave everything for the sake of saving the world but I'm not going to get into argumenting about those parable interpretations. Uh, What I want us to look at instead is to the reality of the kingdom of God being introduced by Jesus Christ. And the question in our minds as we have been trying to study these parables might be, uh, you know, what, what is this kingdom of God, right? I have said that the kingdom of God is not something that you get but it's something that you enter into that you become part of so the question of course in my mind and hopefully in yours is well is then this kingdom something that is just manifested in our hearts or is it a physical kingdom related to political power and the changing of our circumstances and our surroundings how how does it look like what is, what exactly is this kingdom now It is important to remember that the central teaching of Jesus is the coming of the kingdom of God. You can get away from this kingdom of God. Now you can get um, (laughs) over spiritual about it or you can be in denial about it. You'll see what I mean here in a little bit. Let's uh, look at Mark chapter 1, 14, after John was put in prison. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. 
repent and believe the good news. In Matthew chapter 4, 23, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now, Luke has no parallel to Mark, but here is his remark concerning the kingdom that Jesus came to proclaim. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. <laughs> so, for the sake of time, we, uh, we have to kind of like agree on, on this reality that the expression kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are are the same. There are uh, movements that have tried to separate them both and say that the kingdom of God is one thing and that the kingdom of heaven is a different thing. But in reality, they all are synonyms because they are uh, repeated in parallel gospels uh, in the same account as kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. So both expressions are found in 61 separate sayings in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, if you include the parallels, the repeated passages, these two expressions are found 85 times. That means that this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven is important, isn't it? All of them are found in um, key accounts. Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You find the same expression in the Beatitudes where it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You find that expression in the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. He says, I truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And of course, you find kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in in numerous parables, like the ones we have been studying in Matthew chapter 13. And so my point being is that if we are to understand the message of Jesus, we must have a correct interpretation of such expressions, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Now, if you've been in church, if you've been in church a while, you've heard that expression over and over again. And sometimes we even amen it and we don't even know what we really mean, right? Life of the kingdom. It's kingdom, brother. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. And and, and what is it? How does it look like? Now, you would think that by now, 2,000 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection, we all would agree on what it means, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Um, Again, the consensus is that both expressions are equal. But the reality is that when it comes to the meaning of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, Jesus never defined exactly what he meant by the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Seems to me that he assumed that his listeners would understand. Whoever has to ears to hear, let them hear. As a result, though, of Jesus not giving an exact definition... There have been some strange uh, interpretations concerning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. So that's what we're going to try to dive in and, and filter those out. Now, I am often opposed to when it comes to aspects of biblical interpretation that we don't fully understand, taking a position where we say everybody else is wrong and I got this right. <laughs> that's a dangerous claim to make. But it is important that we point out that there have been several interpretations. Okay, what the kingdom of God, when did it come? Is it a present reality or a future hope? Uh, Does it refer to a political power or a spiritual expression? Is it a kingdom that is going to be visible or is inwardly in our hearts only in the kingdom of God? If If that kingdom of God is here and now, then how do we cope with the reality that there is still murder and pain and hate and sickness in our world and promiscuity, right? Because you've heard it said that 
if the kingdom of God, if you're living in that kingdom, there shouldn't be any sickness, there shouldn't be any pain. And if you're not getting the healing, is because maybe you're not praying this way or, or doing these things. or uh, You know what I mean? And, and, and then, then there comes this aspect of confusion and guilt when it comes to the proclamation of the kingdom of God. So, just bear with me for the next five, ten minutes, and then we'll come back around and deal with the present reality and the future hope of the kingdom of God. There are, and we may get a little bit technical here, different schools of interpretation. And so we're going to try to understand uh, some of them. There is what is called the political school of interpretation that approaches the kingdom of God with, uh, with the lens of, 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 of the kingdom of God being a code word for the establishment of a political kingdom. You know, the kingdom that Jesus came to establish relates to all the political atmosphere and, and power. But, but, but it doesn't take long to see Jesus uh, refuting this position. Because if he, that was the case, he would have fought the Romans. <laughs> Yet he didn't. Instead, he told the disciples, if uh, you shouldn't resist a, an evil person, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, slap him back. That's what mine says. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. But, but, but Jesus, instead of talking about that political, you know, uh, approach to the kingdom, he said, no, you, you got to be humble. The last will be first. And, 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 and if anyone forces you to go one mile. Right. Uh, there, now, there's, of course, more into this. And I feel that I don't make justice to these schools of interpretation. They probably have... Argue, uh, good elements and good uh, points when it comes to this approach. But if it was only in terms of a political power, then when Jesus was asked uh, in Mark chapter 12, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the trust. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? What did Jesus say? Well, he said, give back to... I like how you're completing my sentences. Let's, let's keep this going. So, we can, we can move that interpretation aside, right? Then we move into... Uh, some technical word, and there is a word, uh, eschatology, which Pastor Larry knows well what it means. I have more difficulty trying to explain it. It really just relates to the end of times, to the ultimate judgment, to, to the future hope of the souls or human beings. It, it's, it's the end of times. And so this school of interpretations are, are, are named the non-eschatological view, which means that Basically, and again, I'm simplifying this as much as I can. This, this approach of interpretation to the kingdom of God means basically that there is no future to look forward to. Or, or at least it doesn't take priority. And the uh, essential contribution of this message was that the kingdom of God involved the present reign of God in the heart of the believer. It was just in our hearts. The, the kingdom is here. The presence of a new principle. The present inner reign of God in the human heart. This is the kind of view that uses present circumstances to put meaning into the text. You know, when sometimes you really don't hear from God because you don't open His Word, but then whatever you're going through, you say, well, God must be doing something, and, and you try to interpret Scripture according to your circumstances. Uh, now, <laughs> once we seek to understand the message of Jesus and what He meant by the expression, Kingdom of God, it is clear that there is a futuristic view, an eschatological aspect in it, in the sense that the kingdom is breaking into history and that Jesus consistently talk about a future hope for that kingdom to be fully revealed. Okay, then we find another school of interpretation. This is called consistent eschatolog esch eschatological school. I promise we'll get out of these technicalities and we'll land at a safe place together. Can I get an amen? amen. Just don't, don't get lost. Stay with me. 
Jesus in proclaiming the kingdom of God was not speaking. This is the other school of interpretation. Was not speaking of any ethical inward rule by God. But on the contrary of the end of history and the supernatural inauguration of a new age. According to this view, the kingdom of God refers to a future reign of God that Jesus believed was to be inaugurated in the near future. In other words, it's not here, it's there. I'm taking you somewhere. We can push that aside too. Then there is the realized eschatological view. In this one, there was a famous book called The Parables of the Kingdom, interestingly enough. That argued that Jesus proclaimed in his ministry that the kingdom of God had now already arrived. The kingdom of God was therefore not some future manifestation of the rule of God, but was a present reality in the ministry of Jesus. The kingdom of God had come. The harvest was a reality. No futuristic view is here and is here now. That was the view. The kingdom of heaven is here right now. Now, The references which appear to teach that the kingdom of God was in some way still future were either interpreted away or attributed to the reinterpretation of Jesus' actual teachings by the early church. In other words, when it didn't fit their interpretation, they would say, well, the church changed this and changed that, but in reality, it meant this. Now, once we look at passages that talk about the kingdom of God as a present reality. And once we look at passages that talk about the kingdom of God about a fut- as a future hope, we can understand the confusion, right? Because at times it appears that the kingdom is already here. But then another time, at other times it seems like it's something that is yet to come. There's tension in this kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God... He's no doubt is a present reality. Jesus, Jesus brought that kingdom, inaugurated this kingdom. And there are several scriptures where this is, this is demonstrated. In Luke chapter 11, verse 20 says, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now the same text in Matthew 12, instead of saying by the finger of God, says by the spirit of God. But both say that the kingdom of God has come upon you because of the things that I'm doing. It's present. It's right here. Luke 16, 16. It says, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4. Remember when John was in prison and he sends some to ask Jesus if he's the one? What did Jesus say? Yes, tell him I'm the one. No, instead he said... Tell John what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now in this particular account, Jesus alludes to the promises in Isaiah. John would know scriptures, and by Jesus alluding to the prophecies being fulfilled in his actions, uh, Jesus was using a traditional formula to describe what the arrival of the kingdom of God would bring. Are you following? Then we find a manifestation of the present reality of the kingdom of God in the three parables in Luke chapter 15. How many of you have heard the parable of the prodigal son? Right? Right? Pastor Larry preached on it not long ago. In the same chapter, we find the parable of the lost coin and then the parable of the lost sheep. Now, all three are describing exactly what Jesus came to do, aren't they? Jesus is the one that left everything for the sake of his son. (laughs) So it's a present reality. And in the coming of Jesus, the promises of the law of the Old Testament... And the prophets are fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have overcome to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now one more passage, and then we'll jump over these technicalities. (laughs) Once on being asked, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, On being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. 
because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, some have taken this to mean that the kingdom is, as we saw in the non-eschatological view, a kingdom of the heart. Yeah, it's the kingdom of God is in your midst, Jesus said. Now, here's the problem with that interpretation, that the Pharisees didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe in the kingdom. So if interpreted this way, then the kingdom was not in their hearts. And so as the text stands, the text is best, in my opinion, understood as teaching that the kingdom of God is now in their midst because in the person of Jesus, the kingdom of God is present among them or it could be that the kingdom of God is now within their reach of entering the message of salvation the reality that the kingdom of God is here and now doesn't mean that it's going to force you into it it means that it's available for you to jump into it Jesus clearly taught that in his coming the long awaited and the long sought kingdom of God had now Arrived. The kingdom broke in when Jesus came. Okay, so the kingdom of God is present, right? Here and now. But then we also have plenty of passages that talk about the kingdom of God as a future reality. Luke chapter 11, verse 12. He said to them, when you pray, okay, here's your chance to stay awake with me. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. There you go. Your kingdom come. That means it's in the future, right? This prayer doesn't speak of an inner reign. It speaks of a future hope. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here, clearly the petition seeks for God to reign on earth even as he now reigns in heaven. We are praying not for God to just come and do something in us, but to do something through us and among us, right? To change. When we pray for our city and we say, your kingdom come, we want things to change. Not just to be failed. I, just don't, I, I, I don't just want to feel better. I want, I want things to change, right? Often the coming of the kingdom is associated with the final judgment as we Saw in the parables of the weeds and the fish, you know, that there will be a judgment. There will be a separation. The, 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 the wheat and the weeds grow together. And one day, Jesus as a judge will come and separate. And those who place their trust and faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. And those who didn't will not be saved. So there's a future aspect of the kingdom of God. In fact, Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said clearly, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? It's a, it's a, it's a future. The kingdom of heaven is to take place on that day, but at the same time, is already here. So it's here, already here, yet is not yet here. <laughs> There's tension. There are the parables of growth. The kingdom of God is frequently portrayed as a future event. In the Last Supper, you know, Jesus has that meal with the disciples. Paul later writes that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. There seems to be a future reality associated with the coming of the Lord. The kingdom of God comes when the Son of Man returns. Now, from these and other passages, this future hope is something that believers are to pray for its realization. I want you, God, to come. Come, O Lord, come now, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Matthew 25, 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Future. There's, there's a future aspect of the kingdom. So, I'm glad you're still with me. <laughs> the kingdom is a present reality. 
and a future inheritance. It's not only spiritual, but it is a physical kingdom. How do we find the middle ground? And this is the challenge. As a pastor, I'm often concerned about all the sources that we can get information from, all the theological explanations to life, death, resurrection, Jesus, the Bible. Next week, we're starting a series on the Bible and the reliability of the Bible, why we trust the Bible, why I believe that the Bible is the only true book that was revealed by the only one true God. You know, last week, we put a clip of a sermon and somebody commented there like, the comment read something like, how do you know you picked the right God? Humanity has been creating gods for years. There are over 20,000 gods. I didn't engage in conversation because it was probably a robot or something. But I thought to myself, because my Jesus is the only one who prophesied his death and resurrection and pulled it off. Amen. There is no other book like the Bible. There is no other God like the one revealed in the life of Jesus Christ. And there is physical evidence that goes beyond our feelings. <laughs> okay. So, the fact that there are mentions of the kingdom as a present reality and also a future inheritance doesn't mean that we have to choose one or the other. Because the problem sometimes has been that, especially in the uh, evangelists, Circles, and I'm not bashing evangelists, but sometimes they're guilty of this, is that they travel from place to place with the secrets of the kingdom and they call for miracles and healings and they make the church feel guilty if they're not living in this kingdom reality. Because if, if you're in the kingdom, in the kingdom there's no sickness, there's no cancer, there's no poverty. So you should be having resources and you should be healthy and everything should work because if, if not, you're not living the life of the kingdom. And that's a dangerous position to have. I'm getting somewhere, I'll promise you. You can't pick one position or the other when it comes to the already here or the not yet here kingdom. The kingdom, and you may want to remember this clearly, <laughs> every day is already here, but is also not yet here. When we emphasize the already here, we find an emphasis, as I mentioned, on miracles, healings, spiritual victories, breakthroughs, gifts that God has given to the church, and so forth. The problem is that these are accompanied by ignoring all the not yet scriptures that talk about a future hope. And what happens in this interpretation is that the miracle, the healing, the provision, the kingdom life becomes an idol and takes, takes more importance than God himself. And so since those kingdom blessings are supposed to be happening in you, when they do not happen, you get discouraged and you get disappointed and you walk away from church because God didn't answer. I gave everything for that miracle that they told me I should pray for and it didn't happen. <laughs> this approach tends to lead to uh, an illusion of victory that is often shut down by disappointment. Hear me out. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for miracles. I'm, I'm saying your love for God should be beyond your passion for your miracle. The reality is that there is still sin. There is still depravity. Our world is still broken. God is restoring all things, but there's evil all around us. And here's, here's a shocker for some of us. Some things we fervently pray for will just not happen in this life. On the other end, you can go to the other extreme where the emphasis is only on the not yet kingdom. Hear me out. This is dangerous too. Because there are definitely blessings that God has prepared for his children here and now. There are the first fruits of the kingdom of God that can be already and should be already possessed by the church. 
I am convinced that that's one of the reasons why Paul could pray, I have learned to be content no matter the circumstances, right? <laughs> that's why he could write from prison, rejoice in the Lord always, rejoice. It was a present reality with not the present evidence of the kingdom, but it was life in the kingdom. And so when we go to the extreme of, he's not yet, key, not yet here, we tend to be negative about breakthroughs, negative about miracles, giving up on praying for this or that. Why should I even bother? If I just want you to return, Lord. I'm just going to sit down and let the world burn around me. And I'm just waiting because you're bringing the kingdom. So I'll just wait for the kingdom and, and never live in the kingdom that is available here and now. But you cannot just pick one or the other. It has to be both. You got to become kind of like Spider-Man holding two heavy things together, right? Like, ah. I'm not letting go of the here kingdom and I'm not letting go of the not yet. I'm, I, I, like, I, I think that's why Paul wrote something like forgetting what is behind and with my eyes forward in the future. I, what, what does he say? I press on, right? You can't. Press on by looking back and you can't press on by looking forward too much to where it distracts you from pressing on. It's one day at a time, one step at a time. It's here and now. Come on. So the emphasis on the not yet can lead to despair, discourage, discouragement. Denigration of the joy found in the already now kingdom. Even now, God's reign has begun. There are things that are available for His church, for His followers here and now. Even, even now. Despite the circumstances, despite the sickness, despite the pain, despite the sorrow, despite the brokenness, despite the addiction, there are things that are accessible to those that are willing to trust Him and give Him everything. Yeah. Romans 6 verse 2 says, By no means were those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Listen to this. Personal defeats cannot negate the fact that Satan has been defeated. Just because some things didn't work out the way you thought they should doesn't mean that Satan won. He already lost. Jesus himself said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus is the same that told us, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, Jesus added that because we need it. Because otherwise those things, you know, become idols. He said, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. My point being, humanity's redemption has been accomplished. When Jesus is on the cross and received that drink, he said, it is finished. This is why, this is why I have some encouraging words. <laughs> Would you stand up with me? That way they will sink in a little bit better. I want to encourage you to be encouraged by two things. Now listen carefully. have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ you got we got to learn to be encouraged by both defeat and success <laughs> why well because success provides a glimpse of the consummated kingdom that is to be revealed and it fills us with anticipation you have prayed sometimes and God answered didn't he 
that should excite you. If he answered those little prayers that we come up with here and now, imagine how it will be when he finally returns. Yes. Now on the other end, defeat. Defeat causes or should cause a greater longing for the full revelation of the kingdom. My heart breaks when I see pain around me. When I see loved ones being afflicted by the sin in this world and the temptations of this world and the brokenness in this world and the drugs around this world and the promiscuity in this world. Doesn't it break your heart? But I know that even, even then my God is patiently waiting for more people to turn to Him. Why doesn't He come just now? Just, just get it over with and, and just, just, just Just come, Jesus. Just, just come now. Well, he's more patient than you and me. Just as he waited for you to finally turn to him for help. He's waiting for those you love and care for around you to turn to him. Listen, nothing will satisfy your soul like knowing that your name has been written in the book of life. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we only see a reflection as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Did you know that God knows you? And even though He knows you better than some of us know ourselves, He loves us anyway. So, There's tension, right? Revelation 22, 20. I love how it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. And then the people say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I like to pray, Lord, come now come then but as I wait as, as I am in this tension Lord I will I will trust you so I want us to end with this prayer that you and I know well or part of the prayer Matthew 6 9 and 10 says this is how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven father God I pray that For those of us, Lord, that may feel far from you today, that are searching for answers and hope, that your Holy Spirit will take a hold of us, that you will give us a hunger for your word, a desire to know you, and to be reminded that we are loved by you. But I pray for the distractions to be taken away, for addictions to be broken, for your love to cover us you have been good you are good you are here right now and yet at the same time you are yet to come <laughs> and Lord as we wait may we share the burden Lord for the lost world around us in your name we pray the church says Yay. And let's worship for a moment.